Well, it's great to be back among you guys. How many of you guys were here in the first week? All right, so a few of you guys are joining us after the first week, so you're wondering who on earth is this guy? Um, well, my name is Keith Collins, and I'm one of the pastors here at Lakeview, and had the joy of being with you guys in week number one, but uh, you guys have been in wonderful hands. I know Frank has a, an interesting way of making things clear and helpful and, and insightful, so I know you guys have benefited from that. But we are in week number eight. Can you believe it already? That eight weeks have passed, and uh, you guys have survived this long. All right, let, let me... Uh, all right, let me do two things. Let me make sure I catch this announcement for you. There should be some information on your table about something called the Alpha Weekend. And it's not this weekend, but it's the next weekend. So if you want to put that on your calendar, it's May 11th and 12th. And uh, there's some details on there that you want to look through real quickly. But uh, time slot wise, you're, just, you're talking about a Friday night for dinner and, and a, a session uh, that evening, and then Saturday morning as well. Now, let me just encourage you to consider this. You know, we started this whole Alpha meeting saying that, that most of us are in need of, of slowing down, right? It's kind of pressing life's pause button for a moment and, and not just doing the next thing, but thinking about why we're doing the next thing. And whether we even should be doing the next thing. And, and where is this next thing going to take me in the long run? And hopefully, you know, you've, you've benefited from having some nights on Tuesday night to, to, to think through life a little bit. This weekend is, is the Alpha Weekend is, is just another time to do that. But specifically what the weekend targets on is, is introducing us to the way in which God relates to us personally through the Holy Spirit. Right? If you've been learning along with us, you know, we understand God reveals himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and there's a real intimacy of connecting with God through the Holy Spirit where we, we experience and sense the nearness of God in our own lives. And, and I think any of us get to a place where, where that becomes something the way we really, really want. Well, how do you do that, though? I mean, how do you, how do you connect with the, the mystery of God and whoever he is, etc.? Well, that's what that weekend's really about. And so some great time of learning uh, and, and just great time of being together as well. Uh, so folks who have gone through that weekend, it's one of the highlights uh, of everything they experienced here. All right, so your week eight, uh, if I were going to ask you, you don't have to raise a hand or shout back at me, but if I said, okay, where are you at after week eight, right? How's it going? Uh, what has been creeping into your storyline in life over these eight weeks? And if you just stopped right now and you thought, you know, I've taken Tuesday nights for eight weeks in a row to, to just think about God and who he is and, and where my life's at in relation to him. And how's that doing for you? You know, what's that, what's that affecting you, right? Um, you know, it's interesting the, the feedback we get from folks and sometimes hearing from people along the way and even tonight just interacting with a few of you guys tonight. You know, hearing people describe life-changing elements that take place in, in these meetings. And, and listen, it's, it is not because we've invented something here that has life-changing power. It, it's really because we have made ourselves available to the God who intended all along to be intimately involved in our lives. That, that's what we believe God revealed himself to be. And even tonight, the topic we're going to talk about tonight is it's about relating to God. It's about being a part of a family and experiencing this God. So if that's where you've started and that's what you've been encountering over these last several weeks, my question for you now is, all right, so what next? Right? The Alpha course isn't over yet. Um, week eight, so you got next week, you got the, the weekend uh, encounter and one more week, I think, after that. Um, what next? Right? What, what do you do with whatever that, that you've sensed or, or begun to experience uh, in the last several weeks? What do you do next? Well, before I get into the little booklet tonight, I just want to give you a passage from the Apostle Paul. He's a famous guy in Christianity. And just listen to something that he says. And I'm going to tell you why at the end I, I choose this passage for us to, to gain some thought from. It, it's Paul writing to people who lived in a town called Philippi. So it's called the letter to the Philippians. And in chapter 3, verse 8, this is what Paul says. He says, more than that, 
I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. All right, a couple of things in here I just, that just are helpful for us tonight. One of the things that, that I know Frank has been interacting with uh, us about every week is, you know, the Bible makes this clear declaration. It's going to do it again right here. When, when you see the word not, you know, when somebody says not this, it's like they're trying to draw your attention to something. So they're trying to describe something, but they're trying to make sure you don't go over here with that and end up over here thinking I'm talking about this. No, not that. And, and he highlights something when he says that. He says, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. Right? And that word righteousness, you know, we typically use that word when people are being self-righteous, right? It's going to have a negative sense to it. But righteousness in the Bible is, it's about being right with God. It's about being able to know that any moment in your life, you could stand with a sense of confidence and peace and know right now, I'm right with God. And then, you know, a great question and I think probably, I think one of the number one things I would hope the Alpha Course makes clear is answering the question, how do you get right with God? What needs to be in your life, in your resume, in your background, to make you feel like tonight, right now, I know I'm right with God? And did you feel that way last week? Are you going to feel that way next week? Because Paul highlights something here that I think all of us can get tricked into. Not having a righteousness or a sense of rightness of my own derived from the law. Well, that's just a fancy way of not having a rightness that I create by being good enough myself. By following whatever set of rules are out there, whether it's the Ten Commandments, the Golden Rule, societal ideas, but, but not feeling right about my life just because... I've been living pretty decent lately. Paul said, no, that's, that's not what makes me feel right. He says, you know, I have a sense of rightness because I have faith in Christ. And as a result of faith in Christ, there's a righteousness that's not my own that's come to me. And so he has righteousness. You know, if he digs his hands in his pockets, and by the way, you know, if there's a moment when we stand before God one day in his kingdom... The, the only means in is with righteousness. And be careful, it's, it's not with human goodness. Because human goodness quite often for us means I'm not as bad as somebody else. It's based on righteousness. You're going to have to dig your hands in your pockets and pull out some righteousness and be able to present that in order for God to say, hey, you are welcomed in my kingdom. And the question is, where are you going to get that righteousness from? Well, according to Paul, it's, it's a righteousness that God gives to us when we receive it by faith. It just, it's given to us. It's a gift from God. And so he knows, and, and I hope that we are seeing from the Bible, that there's a way for us to be living life today with a sense of, I'm right with God right now. I'm at peace with God. If something were to happen to me, I know that I'd be with God forever. That's what he knew. But he says something else here that's, that's really pretty exciting stuff. He's at this place in his life where he says, right now, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I mean, make, make this real. Paul's a person with, with stuff in his life, people in his life, goals and ambitions in his life. You know, for him, he lived in a day and he was in a, a religious setting. He was not a Christian, but he was in a religious setting where he was actually advancing. He was, a, he was a bit part philosopher, teacher, influential mover and shaker. And he encounters Christ in a way that's going to disrupt all that. He's basically going to lose all of his status. He's going to go from a respected guy who'd probably be sort of like a, uh, an academic lecturer 
who's respected in that field and moves from place to place. And you know, they're welcoming him here at the university tonight. We're going to have Paul come and speak. His name was Saul at that point. But he's willing to lose all that and look like a, a crazy person who's put his faith in some carpenter guy from Nazareth who supposedly died and was raised from the dead. And if he does that, he's going to give up quite a bit in his life. It's going to cost him to believe that. Why would you do that, Paul? Unless it's true. Unless Jesus Christ really is who he claimed to be. And according to Paul, he saw that as more valuable than everything else, right? So you could put in the scales, I've got my life, my fame, my future, my security, everything that people respect about me on the one hand, and I've got knowing Jesus Christ. And he said, this outweighs all all of that. I, I, w- I would be okay with losing all of that. All right, now question for you, because this, this, this kind of cuts through the religiousness of our lives, because I was a religious person before I was truly a Christian, and, and I would not have found myself on the right side of that statement. And because when Paul says, I will take my whole life and lose it all for the sake of knowing Christ... He, you know, Jesus said something like that. He said, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like the man who discovered one day that there was treasure hidden in a field. And out of his joy over that treasure, he goes and he sells everything that he owns. And he takes the proceeds of that and he buys that field so he can have that treasure. Does, does a relationship with God feel that way for you? That, that it contains that much joy and interest and passion. That this is really what I want more than anything else in life. And I, I would be willing to lose anything to make sure I got that. Listen, that was not my version of getting around God growing up. Right? My version was, there are, there's a moral way to live. There are rules to be kept. There are things that the church frowns upon. You shouldn't do that. And if you're serious about religion, then you need to do the things that are associated with religion. Show up in those places. Do those kinds of things. But I can't say that my experience in that moment was joy. I do this because I love it. And, and by the way, I would be willing to suffer the loss of anything else of value to me. In order to have that. That, was, that just simply was not my experience. But yet it's normal for people who really encounter Jesus Christ. The joy of having a relationship with him begins to make everything else pale in comparison. And not be so important to us. And that's where Paul was. And what I love about this verse relevant to what we're talking about tonight. Is Paul says this about 30 years after he had given his life over to Jesus Christ. 30 years later. So it's not like he attended a meeting like this and the first night he's like, oh, I really believe and see who Jesus is. I'm I'm willing just to go after that wholeheartedly with everything that I've got. This is 30 years later. It's gotten old by now, isn't it? No. It's as fresh and as meaningful and as zealous in his own heart and is full of joy, he says, you know, I, I still to this day, I, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ. All right, 30 years from now, after you've completed Alpha, I'm looking around at the age group here, it's not a youth group. Uh, 30 years from now, a lot of you are not going to be with us. Uh, <laughs> probably me too. Um, 30 years from now, you're going to go on from here, right? And, and, and how's that going to happen? How, how are you going to spiritually be in a place where you're, you're as close to God as you've ever been? You're as, you're, the nearness of God and the knowing of God is, is as priceless to you as it's ever been. How's that going to happen? Well, that's what tonight's topic is about. So if you turn with me to page 80 of your Alpha Manual, we're going to answer the question tonight, what about... The church. What about this thing called the church? And and we're going to answer that by just trying to understand what exactly is the church. And there's going to be five kind of word pictures from the Bible that are going to help us understand the church. We won't actually make it through all five of them, but 
First thing that our author here does, though, is he takes us back through really some popular misconceptions because he's recognizing something that I know is true for us here tonight. If I throw the word church out, that's not a word you're going, hey, I've never heard that word before. I don't, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. Right? Everybody in the room's got some kind of idea. Word association. I say church, you think, right? So you, will, you think something, right? And so he's got a list of, of popular misconceptions. He says, you know, people think church, they think services. So we're talking about maybe what time does your church meet as a service, as an activity? That, well, that's the church. Or, or maybe church equals clergy. Uh, maybe it's the church made a decision today to no longer blah, 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 blah. And it's in the news. And, you know, well, what was that? The, the church. Well, you know, with some guys dressed in some garb who got around a table and made a decision and wrote it down and published it, right? Well, then we'd think, okay, well, that's the church, right? Or, or the church is a particular denomination, right? Maybe, our, maybe we grew up around a certain denomination and we've become convinced that's the church. Everything else I'm not quite sure about, but that's the church. Uh, or maybe church is just a building, for you. Hey, where do you go to church? And you tell people what building you go to uh, on Sundays. All right, well, all those are the ways in which we use that word church. But the Bible uses it as well. And when the Bible uses it, uh, it's got a little bit different implications for it. And I, and I think once we see some of those, it'll be very helpful. Right here, here's the first way we'll look at in your outline there. It uses this passage to say the church is the people of God, right? This is what church is. Church is people, right? but not just any kind of people. Here's, here's the Apostle Peter writing in the first century, chapter 2 of his epistle, verse 9. He says this, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own Possession. I mean, just start with that word you. But you are these things. Right? Peter's writing a letter. People are going to receive this letter. So the question is, who are these people? Because they just got quite a resume slapped on them. Right? Are these, are these special people? Are these unique people? Because they're a chosen race? They're a royal priesthood? They are. This group of people being written to is a, royal, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. These are big descriptives, and they are written to everyday individuals, just like you and me, who are followers of Christ. This is the identity of those people who have followed Christ. They put their hope and their faith in Christ, and they are now described this way. All right, so some of these verse, the words would jump out at me. The idea I was a chosen race probably wouldn't get that, but a royal priesthood, that would scream at me. Priesthood? Wait, what do you mean by that? Well... And growing up in New Orleans, I say priest, you think something. Right? Well, okay, well, they weren't thinking what you're thinking. This is first century. Uh, they were thinking Old Testament priests, guys wearing garbs, burning incense, slaying animals, etc. But what was unique to tell them this was in the Old Testament, there was a special group of individuals who God had given them special access to himself that he didn't give to everybody else. So they actually got to come near to God in a way that nobody else did. And that was God's idea. These guys weren't making this up themselves. God had said, you, not everybody can just come near to me casually. But I'm going to allow these guys, these priests, to come near to me. But I'm not allowing everybody to do that. I'm just allowing them to do that. So when you get to the New Testament here, and Jesus Christ has done something so powerful and radical that he's made it possible for every person who trusts him to now come and have access personally to God. So Peter can turn around and say, hey, remember that idea where only a few people could get access to God? He says, well, now you're those people. Every one of you who have put your faith in Christ, you can all come near to God. Right? This is a really mind-blowing concept if you think about it. I mean, how would you answer the question if I were to say, is there anybody on planet Earth who has more access to God than you? Well, okay, well, Billy Graham just died. Um, yeah. Let's see. Um, father so-and-so. Uh, right, you'd have a list of people that you think might have more access to God than you do. But this verse is written to the average individual who's followed Christ 
to find out you have access to God, right? Because God has done something to make you. And this is what he's made. This is where that word people comes in. He's made you a people for God's own possession. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then we're going to get another one of those really clarifying statements in the Bible. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is a very important little line. uh, Because it it helps us think the way the Bible thinks. Did you know the Bible describes people who are in a relationship with God as once you were not? You know, the Bible speaks that way. This is not any of us making this up. This is just the Bible saying that once you were not a people, but, but now you are. Okay, so there's a before and after shot. You ever see those diet things? You know, you get the before and after shot. At some point, the guy swallowed the right pill and he sucked down and, you know, he lost like 80 pounds overnight. And here he is now, before and after. Well, something spiritually is like that in the Bible. Before, we were in one kind of condition and, and our relating to God was described one way. And, and here it says, once you were not a people. That's an uncomfortable thought. I'd like to assume that no matter what, I have always been right with God. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Now it teaches I can become right with God, but something's got to happen to get me to that place. It says once you had not received mercy, but now you have. Right, so there's this, there's this line that we cross in life at some point, and every person, according to the Bible, has to cross this line. So if, if I was born, and I just lived the way I was born, and I never crossed a line, then these things don't apply to me. Once I was not a people, but now you are. There's this great relationship with God that awaits those who receive the rightness that comes from Christ by faith. And that's what Peter's describing here. But what I love about this description of, of people is it's people right now who have a purpose in their life. Right? You are a chosen people in order to show forth the excellencies of him. Like you're going to become this broadcast, this light-bearing entity that now has a, a reason in your life. A reason that's bigger than any of us as individuals. Maybe you always wanted to grow up and be a fireman or an athlete or whatever it was. Maybe you got to be that. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you're in a place where you're wondering, you know, what's even the purpose of my life? Well, God turns around and says, I've always had a purpose for your life. I have a purpose for you to show forth my, my life through your life. And God calls us into that purpose. And, and listen, this can be some great news to realize that, that there's something bigger for my life than just what I've come up with, what I can do. God's got a plan for me that's bigger than that. I think an interesting thought from an author. Paul Tripps writes this. It's a classic scene. The Western culture. She stands before the microphone, beautiful and poised, a finalist in the Miss America contest. The hosts ask her what she'd like to accomplish during her reign, and she says, I'd like to create world peace, solve world hunger, and liberate all the caged parakeets in the entire world. (laughs) We've all heard it a hundred times. It's been the fodder for many late-night stand-up comedy routines. Yet, for all our cynical smiles and sarcastic comments in the face of the contestants' grandiosity, there is something deeply and uniquely human about what she's said. There's woven inside of each of us a desire for something more. A craving to be part of something bigger, greater, and more profound than our relatively meaningless day-by-day existence. Maybe that's why a human being would ever want to climb Everest, traverse the oceans in an all-too-small sailboat, or attempt any feat not yet accomplished by a fellow human. Perhaps that's why we get hooked on politics, sports, or a myriad of causes that give us something to fight for. We simply weren't constructed to live only for ourselves. We are placed on earth to be part of something bigger than the narrow borders of our own survival and our own little definition of happiness. Well, this this verse points out something. That God has called a people for a purpose. Like he has gone out into the world and assembled 
these people together to accomplish something, to be truly part of something bigger than our own individual preferences and story. You know, listen, and maybe you've already experienced this in your life. You can, you can run your own race for your own reasons, run it hard, train, sacrifice, and, and you know, you'll get way into that race and something floats up and says, there's got to be more than this. It just happens to everybody. Well, there is more than this. That doesn't mean God didn't have individual plans for you. But he had you to be part of something bigger. Part of his purpose. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but that should be associated with whatever it means to be a part of the church. Right? Finding purpose in life. That's part of the church. All right, well, here's another word picture. Uh, there's a few of them there on page 81. What about this picture? The family of God. All right? There's this, this household dimension, right? Then this is the church, right? The Bible's going to describe the church as something that feels like a family. It feels like a household. Ephesians chapter 2, Apostle Paul writes this. He says, He, speaking of Jesus, He came and He preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, right? This is, this is Jesus preaching to the religious people and the non-religious people. For through Him... We both have our access in one spirit to the Father, right? Not just the force be with you, uh, not just some impersonal, not luck, but we have access to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, Right, these, these words are the words that characterize what does it mean to be in the church? Well, church should feel this way. Ch church should be a gathered sense of collective awareness of the fatherhood of God. That, that we understand. Like when you gather together with a family and you got the patriarch, you got the father who's, who's kind of this head of the... And it gives everybody a sense of context and relationship because they're all related to the father. And we become brothers and sisters in that relationship because God had intended that you and I would experience something that felt like family. And I don't know if that's true for a lot of us as we experience church. It doesn't always feel like family. It feels a little stiffer. It feels a little more distant. It feels a little more formal, perhaps, sometimes. How shocking to discover God's idea was that you and I would be a part of something where we feel real a couple of things. We feel related to other people. Right? Like there's a real relationship between you and me. You know, we're not just these strangers trying to figure out whether we want to talk about whether the Pelicans are going to win tonight, which I, I don't hold out a lot of hope, but I am very hopeful. Um, <laughs> and we'll get you out of here early enough to go watch that. Um, in God's plan, there was, there was a reason why we had a relationship. And, and that relationship is meaningful, right? I mean, there are, there are special events in your lives. There are things that are coming up. You know, it's May, so there's, you know, there's Mother's Day, there's graduations. Uh, there's things that we want to celebrate. It's, it's the people that make those things special, isn't it? Right? Anybody planning on going to a graduation where you know nobody? Right? I mean, they've got a lot of them out there. You know, you just go and show up and just look at the list of names. And I don't know anybody, but I'm going to watch them all get their little thing turned and walk across the platform. Now, you're going because you've been a part of that person's journey. And they've done well and they've finished something. And you want to be with them in that moment and say, hey, how exciting this matters. And you're, and you're with their family and their family with you. Those relationships matter. But somehow we've invented this thing called church that doesn't have that in it. It, it, it's like, that's, that's not God's invention. Somebody else invented that. But how about this? When, when you and I are in families, there's not only a sense of relationship, but there's also a sense of responsibility for each other. Right? I mean, you're uh, watching the news or you come across something and... You hear that there's an eight-car pileup on I-10, and you know there's a couple of injuries, blah blah blah. Um, 
He even lists the names of some people that were injured. And you don't know any of them. You, you just turn to the next channel, right? What if you are related to one of those people? What if one of those people are your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, your son or daughter? Do you just turn to the next channel? No, no big deal. Life, I mean, life happens. That's unfortunate. I hate to hear about that. No, you, you rush to the scene, don't you? Because when you have a relationship with people, you, you own you want to own a sense of responsibility for them. You care about their well-being. You care about what's going on with them. Church is supposed to feel that way. That's, that's, these are God's descriptions of the church, that we would be together with people with a sense of feeling responsible for their care and their well-being and being involved in their lives. Right? All right, well, how about this picture? So you have household, you got family, you got people. How about the body of Christ? This is a familiar term. I don't know if you've ever looked in the Bible to figure out why did people start calling the church the body of Christ? Well, here's why. Again, the Apostle Paul is going to write this. He's going to write to the Corinthians, so people who live in the town called Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, he says this. But one and the same Spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually just as he wills. For even as the body is one, yet it has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. And then he goes on and uses a little illustration here. He says, you know, it's like, you know, some people are like a foot. And, and you know, they, they, they're important in the body. And some people are like a hand, and somebody else is like an eye. And so he uses this illustration. But the illustration communicates some pretty important stuff. God's intention was when he went and collected a bunch of individuals into a relationship with him, he was also assembling them into a relationship with each other. He was, he was if you will, drafting body parts so that there would be this one being where somebody was this finger and somebody else was that one and then somebody was an eye and someone was an ear. Everybody had a role to play. And when everybody came together and played those roles, together something amazing could happen through that body. And this is how God had planned it. Somewhere along the way, I've even heard this said by people. You know, like religion. You know, Keith, you know, religion is a private matter. You, know, you don't bring that kind of stuff up with people. You don't talk about that kind of stuff. You know, that's, that's just people's personal private business. Um, not really. No, it's not. not. Not in the Bible, it's not. Which might be some great news for us. Maybe we've been keeping something private that has been limiting our experience of it. Right, so this is not about you being, right, you know, if, if, you're, if you're a body part, you know, the best thing that can happen to you is to find the rest of the body. <laughs> I mean, let, let's just, let's walk out of the building here tonight. You and your spouse, you know, you're holding hands. You're on your way down the sidewalk, getting ready to get back in your car. And, and you're thinking, oh, that was, that was interesting tonight. And, and I don't know, you're walking along and you just come across an ear. <laughs> just sitting on the ground right there by itself. I, I'm pretty sure you're not going to look at that and go, honey, honey, stop. This is beautiful. Look at that. <laughs> All right, when you're done throwing up, you're going to try and figure out, what uh, that's an ear. There's, there's someone, oh, oh, there's an ear on the ground by itself. You know, there's something weird about a body part that's not part of a body, isn't it? And so this illustration of this is what the body of Christ is, it, it only works. Stop celebrating this term and not being attached to anybody. It's disgusting, right? But it's very meaningful if you understand what it means to be a part connected to other parts. Because now we, we kind of need each other in a certain way. And we function in a certain way. Right? I mean, right now, you know, maybe, maybe my eyes would really love to see what's the weather like outside. But right, from right here, no hope. 
no hope. I really want that. I really hope for that. Not happening. Until the feet and the legs say, hey, we could help with that. And they carry me over to the window, and I get to look outside. Wow, look at the weather. Right? There's... Your stomach's going to get hungry, or maybe it's not for a while since you ate so well tonight. Uh, but when you came in here and you were hungry, weren't you glad your hands cooperated with the process? <laughs> and that your taste buds joined in and said, hoo hoo, keep it coming. This isn't bad at all. Uh, God designed the body to where each part functions and it matters. And he said, that's like the church. When you're part of the church, you function in people's lives and they function in your life and together this magnificent thing takes place where God reveals himself through individuals who have come together to be part of something bigger than themselves. All right, one more illustration that's here. He uses a holy temple, right? These are just pictures that the Bible picks up and says, hey, if you want to figure out what church is like, these are the images that will help you. All right, so he picks up this idea of a holy temple, right? I mean, so picture... Middle East, turn of the century, first century, you've got these brick, giant, you know, Egyptian-looking, giant bricks, cinder block kind of looking things, and they're, they're coming together to build buildings with these things. And some of them were magnificent, incredible things. All right, look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. Let's see, I don't have that one. Let me read it for you. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. All right, so now we're going to shift illustrations. We were talking body parts before. Now we're going to go into the construction field for you guys that are in that. Now we're talking foundations, the apostles and the prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Right? These words are just loaded with meaning. And Peter goes on and says, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house. Alright, so this, this is a description of this thing we're talking about tonight, the church. So here's the illustration. God desired, the God who is everywhere, desired to have a place where he would uniquely allow his presence to dwell there. That doesn't mean God stops being everywhere. He is. But it also means that he's not everywhere in the same place the same way. He chooses to dwell in certain places. And the place that he says he chooses to dwell, in the Old Testament, it was the temple. It was actually a building that was built. And God said, I'm going to show up in a special way right here. You guys come check it out. And people came to that place and God showed up in unique and special ways right there. And then he picks that illustration up and he says, okay, now, no longer that kind of a building. Now, you are the temple of God. And I don't mean that individually like a body part lying on the side of the street. I mean collectively together. It's like as though you and I are hundreds of bricks that God said, you know, I, I, want, I want to build a place where my spirit's going to uniquely dwell. So I'm, I'm going to grab you, and you, and you, and you, and you. And what's interesting is God doesn't just grab a pile of bricks and just throw them into a pile. And, and then somehow this illustration is just about the pile. Hey, welcome to the pile. Everybody's part of the pile. Hey, you know, you get to know God, you become part of the pile. Sounds a little unorganized, but okay. Uh, but that's not the illustration. The illustration is God is like this master architect who is building a building and he's strategically putting every brick in place. And that, that's going to have an, an effect on how you relate to people and who you are in your life. Right? I've never been able to illustrate this before until we put this brick building up. All right, so we have... This brick right here, this, this brick right here is Ray Pratt's. This is Ray Pratt's The Brick. Have you guys met Ray? Right here in the front. Probably you know him at some point. Went to Holy Cross, knows half the city of New Orleans. All right. Um, all right, so this is Ray Pratt's. At some point, God takes Ray Pratt's out of doing his own life his own way and says, hey, Ray, I've got a purpose for you. I want to make you part of the building I'm building where I'm going to dwell uniquely. Ray, I'm going to put you right here. And... I'm going to put these two people underneath you to, to help you, to support you. And they're going to be a part of your life. And man, as you get started, Ray, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have these people to encourage you. I'm going to 
I'm going to use them to help you see more things about me so you can grow and, and love me all the more. So, so Ray, uh, I could have put you by these bricks over here, but you know, I specifically chose these people to be in your life, and, and I want you there. And next thing you know, God puts a brick here and a brick here. And so alongside Ray are, are some other people in his life that God has put there. This one's really easy to get along with. And this one, not so much. But they're there by God's design. I won't say which one was Linda. But um, <laughs> they're, 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 a part, they're a part of Ray's life strategically, on purpose. God put them there. And next thing you know, as Greg keeps moving on through time and, and cooperating with God and walking with him, next thing you know, there's people showing up on top, that, that they're being set on his life. He's now a means of supporting these other people and being a part of their life. Kind of the way these guys were for him. Now Ray's turned around and he's doing that for others. And he's caring for them and he's encouraging them and he's with them when it's hard and trying to help them think through hard situations and get wisdom from God for those kinds of things. All right. I'm not making this stuff up. This is God's illustration for what he calls the church. He's building something. And in all this brickwork of relationships and connections with one another, God says, in that place, I'm going to uniquely dwell in that place. And that place is called the church. And by the way, it's, it's no longer a building. Right? We are the living stones, right? You as living stones. You are a living stone that God has put in place in this building. So it's, it's no longer bricks and pieces and chunks of rock. It's human beings that now are the place where God uniquely dwells in our lives. So, listen, God had something in mind for this thing called the church. And, and, and I get it, unfortunately... We've kind of shanghaied that, or we've just missed it, or everything I just described, maybe, maybe that's not been the experience of whatever you would call church. Oftentimes, church is just not something that we're drawn towards, quite honestly, because it, it, it doesn't feel like what we've been talking about. It, it doesn't have these qualities. It doesn't feel like deep family relationships, where people relate and have responsibility for each other. It doesn't feel like interworking strategic body parts where each person's uniquely given gifts by God to serve and care and influence one another. It doesn't feel like a strategic set of relationships in our lives where we're supporting and being supported and caring for one another. It just doesn't feel like that. All right, this is, this is what church might feel like for some of us. And did for me. Uh, all right, there's a, there's a time slot in the week where we have designated that we're going to drive hopefully less than five or ten minutes. We're going to arrive. We are going to strategically find the best parking place in the parking lot. Uh, we know that the best parking place is not necessarily the one closest to the door because some people are really slow getting out and getting out is a priority. So we've learned where to park so we can get out the fastest. We're going to walk through the front door. There's going to be somebody at the front door handing out little pieces of paper to us on the way in. Probably make eye contact. Maybe not a whole lot of exchange there. We're going to go in. We're going to see some people that we recognize, but we don't quite remember their names. Uh, well, there's one or two. Uh, and there's one of our neighbors, and so we know their name. Uh, we'll probably wave politely. We will be there for 45 minutes, hopefully less, and then we will go back out, and we will get in our car, and we will take the leaf resistance to get out of the parking lot, and we will go home. All right, now my question is, did I just describe a visit to church or a visit to Walmart? Because that's kind of how Walmart is, right? It's, they're not trying to be personal. They're just, they're just trying to serve up some goods to you and give you the flyer on what's on sale when you walk in and, and maybe you recognize a couple of people, maybe you don't. But, but there's no sense that you're looking for the, the Walmart workers and the co-shoppers there to be some brick in the wall for you, you know? That, that's kind of how we do gathering sometimes. Unfortunately, if that's what church gatherings have turned out. Can you imagine if you're God and you stare down at that 
that you don't look at that and go, oh my goodness, how much they have missed what I had in mind. That's the farthest thing in the world from what God had in mind. And you know, here's the really challenging part about that. Without a question, I don't, I don't need to know your story to know that your story's got some <coughs> speed bumps, potholes, and ditches in it. Difficulties, delays, struggles, fears, a sense of being overwhelmed, people betray us, conflicts take place, people you trusted do things you never imagined they could ever do. All, right, all that just to say, hey, life can be hard, can it? You know, when, when life starts to fall apart and have its moments, you just need people in your life a certain way. And God thought of that. God said, that's what my church is supposed to be. It's supposed to be people who care for one another and who have a sense of ownership and responsibility and involvement with each other, that they sacrifice for each other, that they seek to get to know one another, that they're compelled by something on the inside of them that makes them love even people who are difficult, people who are not like them, people of different races, people of different economic uh, backgrounds, people who hate your favorite football team and don't vote for the same politicians that you vote for, but yet there'd be something in your heart toward those people that you actually love them like they're your own family. Now listen, I'm, I'm not just telling you the story of a few ideas that are in the Bible. Um, I, I've lived this experience. And I've, had, I've had the unique privilege of uh, being outside of a church, in a church, and part of a church, and then eventually a pastor in a church for quite a long time and did all that in one place here. I didn't know anything about some of this stuff. I didn't know much at all about the Bible. I come to a relationship with Christ, but I didn't know about the church. And when I set foot in what used to be the building that was Lakeview Christian Center in 1983, I, I wasn't sure about the people that were there. I wasn't sure what to expect. I certainly wasn't comfortable with a few of the things going on in there. You understand, I walked into a church building and there were, there were drums on the platform. <laughs> And people were singing loudly. Some of them even were clapping their hands. I mean, I, I literally didn't fully sit down. I just kind of came in the first time and said, no, I'm good. <laughs> I'll just stay right here. <laughs> um, and then I got around some of these people. I think the only person I knew in the church at that time was Frank and Annette. And got introduced to some folks. And it was like overnight. I can't even remember their feeling like there was a speed bump. There, there were relationships. And there were people who cared. And they were involved. And I wanted to be involved with them and get to know them more. And, and it crossed age groups. And I was 19 years old walking into this place. And next thing you know, I'm, I'm hanging out with people who are 15, 20 years older than me. And there's, there's no sense of, well, that's kind of weird. It's like, no, just people who shared a common love for God interestingly share a common love for each other. And that had an impact on my life. It had an impact on all the seasons of life that I've walked through, all the crashes, all the difficulties, all the questions, all the uncertainties of life, uh, all the not knowing if I'm doing it right, what am I doing, where am I going, am I going to get married, am I not going to get married, am I going to have too many kids or not, which I do have too many kids. Uh, but but people, people walked with me through all that, and people related to me through all that. And, and eventually I went from a guy who just walked through the door of this place to eventually becoming one of the pastors here and, and serving here as a pastor for 25 years now. Because these things, this stuff really exists, right? I mean, I, I have bricks in my life that have made a difference to me. And you're sitting at the table with folks who have stories like mine to tell, that they were a part of something that, that had an impact, that it was, it was strengthening and vitality to them and encouragement to them. So here, the one thing I'd want to encourage you in is, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul did something that 30 years later, he was as lit and as loving and as excited about who God was as he was in, on day one, even more so. 
because he did stuff between day one and year 30. He was a part of a church. He was part of these relationships. God could use that in his life to further what he had begun at some point. And so the great encouragement I want to give to you tonight is, you know, when you, when you get done with the Alpha Course here in a couple of weeks, what, what are you going to do next? Well, you know, the Bible's pretty helpful in that it's, it's, it's trying to tell you, don't, don't be an ear on the sidewalk. Get, get attached. Don't be just a brick in a pile somewhere, or worse than that, a brick off by yourself. Get collected and be meaningfully connected to other people who are also walking with Christ and who are experiencing something that sounds like this. Well, that's the church. All right, so I want to ask you a question. What are you going to do after Alpha to keep going with God? Have you thought about having your life be this kind of connected to a church? Be a part of a church. Connect your life to a church. Be intentional about it. I mean, you've been here, some of you guys have been here all eight weeks of Alpha. You, you didn't accidentally show up here. You intentionally showed up here every one of these weeks. Well, intentionally be a part of a church. Um, what will keep you from that? Um, Keith, I, I'm, just, I'm just so busy. Okay, well, welcome to the planet. Everybody is, right? But we're too busy to do things that are really, really important? I hope not. This is really, really, really important. Uh, well, you know, I'd like to sleep in on Sundays. Uh, well, whatever. You know, I mean, you've got to do something to make things that are meaningful in your life happen, right? Um, one of the things that I know Alpha does is it, is it awakens in people a sense of a desire to be near to God. I, I just want to experience more of God. I, that's, I just I heard some things that were very helpful. Um, if you, if you have been sitting through Alpha meetings, and I just say this because some people will say this. It's a common thing for us to hear. If you've been sitting through these Alpha meetings and you, and you have walked away from one or two or three of them and said, you know, I, I've, I've learned more here than I've learned in all the years of going to church. Right. If that's the case, whatever you do when you leave here, I cannot encourage you to go back to the church that you've been going to. If you've learned more here in this brief amount of time than you've learned in all the years that you were part of a church, listen, life is way too short for you to get little tiny eyedropper fills of God along the way in your journey. God meant for you to know him much more deeply. This should be an introduction at best, a review of things that you long ago have grown dear and near in your heart and deeper in your heart. And if that's not the case, whatever you do, do something in the future that changes that. Go somewhere where you see people living like bricks and body parts and being affected by Christ Living a life that says, hey, you know, put my whole life on the one side and knowing Christ on the other, I'll walk away from everything. Get around those kinds of people. Spend time with them and see the impact that God has on your life. Um, all right, one more, one more. All right, I'm, I'm a pastor, so I have a jealousy for this topic. Um, I'm, I'm a little biased in it, but I think I'm, I'm right uh, in my bias. Doesn't everybody think they're right in their bias? But... Um, <laughs> I'm about sure I'm right, though. Uh, <laughs> all right, if you, are, if you are a follower of Christ, right, that's a good explanation for what a Christian is. If you are a follower of Christ, then, then you would follow him into the church. If you're not part of a church, and I'm really speaking to people who would say, hey, you know, Alpha's been great. Uh, I know I'm a Christian. You know, Frank gave out the curious, and I, I know I know I'm a Christian, and I ask you tonight. But are, are you part of a church? Well, you know, I come to Alpha, and um, and I come back to Alpha, and I do a few other things. But no, not really. Um, okay, you're a, you're an ear on a sidewalk. And what you gonna do about that? Come back to Alpha next time? Well, that's fine. At some level. But God's got more for you than that. 
This is an introduction to all that God has. And we're glad to provide an introduction, but he's got more for you. And we want to encourage you, go on into more. So get into a church. You know, how do you do that? Uh, if you know people, I found this church because I knew a guy who I knew his life was affected by Jesus Christ. I watched it. I saw it. And I learned things from it. So when it came time for me to say, hey, um, I'm looking for a church. I'm not a part of one. Where do I find one? Uh, he actually recommended a few to me. I visited around town. And I said, hey, where do you go? And he came here. So I said, okay, I'm, I'm coming here. I'm going to check it out. And, and it stuck. And I've been here ever since. Um, but if you know somebody who's living a life that's affected by Christ, ask them, hey, where do you go to church? Can I come with you this Sunday? Right? Kind of break some of the weirdness. Um, you guys have already, you know, you've already been showing up here every week, right? So I think you know the address. Do you know how to, do you know how to find this building? All right. The building is here on Sundays. Uh, and most of us are here on Sundays as well at like 10 o'clock. Um, you're welcome to come here. And, and listen, I'm not a, uh, I'm, I, I don't, I don't want to convince anybody to be a part of any church. That's God's job. I just, I just want to give God the opportunity to speak to you about that. And so the way you get to hear from God is show up in some of these places. Don't just say, oh, I think I'm going to go. Well, come show up. Nobody's going to put a gun to your head and force you to be a part of this church. If you don't feel like God's got you here, right? As far, as far as I'm concerned as a Christian, if you don't feel like there's a treasure buried in that field that you're ready to sell everything for and have it, I'm not sure you're really ready to be a Christian. So you're welcome to come check this place out. Uh, you might be like me, stand at the back door, not sure you want to go in. Uh, that's cool. Uh, I get that. I really do. You might come and say, hey, you know, not exactly for me. Can you recommend something else? Or maybe I know somebody else. But the one thing don't do is don't leave the Alpha Chorus with no plan to keep going with God. And God's plan to keep going is the local church. Real bricks where you get to be one of them relating to others who are in your life because God put them there. All right? All right, I think we're done. Um, all right, the guys at your table are going to give you some stuff that will help you in, in that uh, journey through finding a church. There's some information you're welcome to look at there. Don't forget the Alpha Weekend, not this weekend, but the next weekend. Please make plans to be a part of that. You won't regret it, I promise. All right, we're going to take a five-minute break for the bathroom and then right back here for some discussion. <laughs> <laughs>